thank you everyone for, for joining the webinar today. We have yet another really filled progressing talk, um, another webinar this month um, with just a lot of innovation baked into some amazing work um, from a researcher. So I'm going to share my screen here to give a little bit of an introduction um, on what we're gonna hear today from Joel. So Joel Berman is gonna be talking to us today a little bit about physiological considerations, um, employing these in a multimodal imaging protocol. Talk a little bit about the pitfalls that he's encountered and methodologies that he sort of advanced and found progression in um, and look at where uh, you can kind of take this approach. So of course we are, we are NEREX. We're a group of people excited and driven uh, and working hard to support innovative research in the FNIRS field. We're here really just to continue to see really awesome work like this progress. And we're really happy to be able to host these webinars, quite a few that we're having this month, uh, showing some of the really amazing things that are happening in the field. It's progressing really quickly. There's a lot of really neat things. And I think it's just a great opportunity for everyone in the field to be able to share you know, what they're doing um, and you know, learn from each other. And I think Joel will do an awesome job of helping with that. So there's a few of us here in the background moderating, helping with the webinar itself. My, my name is Jeremy Bernison. I'm a US scientific consultant um, focused on, on groups here in North America, including Canada. Uh, Amy is going to be helping us. She's part of our scientific marketing group. And Alina will be, will be helping us as well, part of our admin team. So a couple of considerations for everyone joining uh, the webinar today. Uh, please note that you are muted. We'll leave you, you muted during all the talks so that Joel can continue to share all the exciting work that he's been doing. Questions are welcome at any time though. So you'll see a lot of really cool things happening in Joel's presentation. So I implore you to write down any questions that you have um, and you're able to use the Zoom chat to go ahead and type in any, any questions, comments that you have as well. So after today, um, we'll put together the recording of the webinar and you'll be able to, to go and look at this and review some of the cool information that you'll learn about um, on our webinars page. And then if you have additional questions, you know, feel free to reach us at consulting at nerex.net. We're happy to, to answer any questions about some of the content that was brought up today, FNIRs in general, um, and put you in touch with, with the right people to answer any of your questions, let's say. So our, our guest today, our presenter is Joel Burma. He <clears throat> has a bachelor's of human kinetics from the University of British Columbia that he completed back in 2018. Um, he's done his master's recently in 2020 at the University of Calgary and is completing his PhD in the cerebrovascular physiology field. This focuses on cerebrovascular regulation um, using this multimodal approach including transcranial Doppler, uh, FNIRs, and uh, electroencephalography. You'll see a lot of other cool gadgets that Joel has, has worked with. So I think from there, I will give the stage to Joel so he can begin sharing with us. Everything looks okay? Looks great. Awesome, thank you so much for that introduction and having me here today. Um, as mentioned, I am employing a multimodal imaging protocol for my PhD. I'm just gonna kind of walk through some of the advancements, some of the limitations, some of the times I pulled my hair out, you know, some of the hairs have gone gray a bit earlier. So I'm just gonna walk through and kind of hope, hopefully to guide the field to maybe not make the same mistakes I did or kind of get the ball rolling if this is something that you or your lab wants to um, engage in. So as mentioned, I'm a PhD student out of the University of Calgary, um, co-supervised by two amazing individuals, Dr. Jonathan Smurl and Dr. Jeff Dunn. Um, we are located in Western Canada. Um, really cool thing between our two labs is we can do a lot of fascinating research. Um, so as you can see here, we have a lot of different neuroimaging. Um, we do physiological testing with different parameters. We do a lot of exercise testing, um, as well as we are also part a concussion lab. Um, so we do various aspects with concussion testing, looking at symptom exacerbation, 
um, substance and threshold exercise, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you'll see how kind of what I'm doing is hopefully kind of going to be tailored towards that down the line in the future. So for today, what I'm going to focus most upon is kind of this image right here is kind of that combination or the multimodal approach of exactly what I'm doing. Um, and I will kind of start off by saying, yes, the multimodal neuroimaging approach is a very kind of broad based term. And there's a lot of different things you can go or a lot of different techniques, modalities you can, you can combine. Um, so I'm going to focus most of kind of just what I'm doing and why I'm doing this. But before I get into that, and this is kind of what I'm going to talk about through today is first off, I'm just going to give a physiology example. Why is physiology important? Why is it something we should be measuring um, during our brain assessments? I'm going to talk about my multimodal protocol, um, considerations and other recommendations, you know, those frustrations, um, nights I lost sleep over, et cetera, uh, as well as the future directions and goals for what I hope to achieve. So I'm going to start off with a physiological example. Uh, and to do this, I know this may not be your domain, but I'm going to get you to pretend that you are also a concussion researcher. And you are on the sideline of a sporting event, and you witness someone experience this hit. So they get sandwiched, hit in the head, fall down, they have a bit of flexion. Um, they're diagnosed with a concussion, and you, being your uh, concussion researcher, think, hey, let's bring them in for testing to see the acute changes that occur following injury. And so you bring them in, you measure them, you get this activity, then you measure them 60 days later, and you're like, whoa, there's a difference. Clearly, it's something going on. The injury changed brain physiology. Let's publish it. Now, my one caveat to that um, would be, how do we know that it is strictly due to the injury and not other physiological parameters? As we know, there are numerous uh, kind of influences that can change cerebral blood flow. So for example, um, neural activity, blood pressure, sympathetic, parasympathetic branches in the nervous system, chemical stimuli, carbon dioxide, um, as well as cardiac output. So if we go back to our example, and if anyone's had a concussion, you may understand this. You could imagine coming into a research lab one day after having a concussion, you don't feel right, you're nervous. Um, what do you do when you're nervous? Well, maybe you're a bit more sympathetic, you're breathing a bit heavier, so you're hyperventilating. Well, now you're changing your carbon dioxide levels. How do we know that this is strictly due to the injury if we aren't fully understanding those physiological measures as well? Um, so for example, in this case, I kind of presented is say someone was nervous following and they increased the breathing, we could actually under, under kind of estimate the differences that we're seeing between clinical population, right? So someone has a concussion, they're hyperventilating, they have a diminished response. Um, we may not adequately capture kind of what's occurring. And, you know, if, if we're basing clinical decisions or return to play decisions based upon these in the future, well, we may not be making the best estimates. And so kind of, I performed a self-study, I think two weekends ago, I came into the lab and I hooked myself up to a bunch of equipment. Um, in this case, I just did transcranial Doppler ultrasound because it's super easy. Um, and I intonated my posterior super artery, which is the one that feeds the visual centers in the brain. And essentially what I did is I performed the six trials of this task, just, uh, and I guess when, why I did this task is because we can get this nice response where we have eyes closed and we can get a baseline value. We can have participants engage in this Where's Waldo task, uh, capture the peak value. We can look at the percent increase as well as the total activation or this area under the curve during this response. Um, and I did this under various conditions while changing my physiology. So for one, I just did a eucapnia control where I um, didn't change any of my physiological parameters. The second aspect, I performed a hypercapnia protocol. So I slowed my breathing to about three breaths a minute and I increased my end titles to around 50 millimeters of mercury. Then I did a hypocapnia protocol or I, hyper <laughs> I started hyperventilating, blowing off the amount of carbon dioxide in my vasculature. And I did the same response to assess, well, how would that impact it? I also did one where I constricted all my muscles or contracted all my muscles to hopefully try and induce some sympathetic activity. Uh, as well as I did one during what we call squat stand maneuvers. And I did this at a given frequency just to kind of mimic a naturally occurring myer wave going through the system. Um, another way to look at this basically is you just stand upright, you perform a little squat, and this is essentially going to increase your skeletal muscle pumps to increase venous return, which is going to increase ejection fraction, which is going to cause these massive swings in blood pressure. 
Um, and as you can see, we perform this at about 0.1 Hertz, which would mimic sort of the Meyer wave going through. And so, in other words, what I did was I looked at this metabolism response or this neurovascular coupling response during while well, controlling for all the other factors. I did this while increasing my uh, arterial CO2. I also did this while decreasing. During the muscles contracted, I would have increased my sympathetic activity to some extent, but again, uh, physiology is all integrated. So it's probably, I also influenced my blood pressure and cardiac output to some extent, um, as well as I did those myro waves. So I was cyclically my blood pressure between raises and lowers. And what did I find? Well, when the physiological control, essentially I found this really nice, robust response um, from baseline, eyes open, which is the time at zero, the, the solid line. And I got this activation where values don't mean too much, but just for reference sake, uh, about 35 for baseline, 40, 50 for peak, relative increase around 40, area under the curve around 300. When I did this, when I reduced my breathing and increased the amount of carbon dioxide, this was, the, so the baseline was higher, which we would expect. Um, the peak was about the same. The relative increase was about 75% of what we would expected. And the area under the curve was about 80%, uh, just under 80% of what we'd expect during eucapnea. When I did this with the hyperventilation, we saw the baseline was drastically reduced by about five centimeters per second. We saw the peak velocity was reduced around 12 centimeters per second. Um, reductions to relative, the relative increase, as well as there was a substantial decrease in the total activation. So again, if we go back to the example um, of the concussion athlete, or the concussed athlete coming into the lab, we don't know the extent that their breathing patterns could impact their measures. Um, it can impact your ability to make those decisions. Um, and I do overlay all these just to kind of show the curves at the end. Um, and then when I did the muscles contracted, this as expected, wasn't enough to cause a change. I think I saw about a six millimeter mercury change in blood pressure, but again, it wasn't sufficient enough to cause any massive changes, um, as well as when I did this during the squat stand maneuver. Um, and there's a couple of really cool things that I didn't expect when I was doing this, kind of mimicking the Meyer wave. Um, and one interesting thing I noticed was um, down here, you can see these massive drop-offs. Um, and a cool function with transcranial Doppler ultrasound is we're able to capture uh, what we call a critical closing pressure. And so essentially, if, you're, if you don't have enough blood flowing through a certain uh, artery, the vessel is just going to collapse in upon itself during the rest of diastole until the next systolic pulse goes through. Um, and essentially, when we combine the squat stand, so when you stand upright, blood's going to start to pool again. When we combine that with the eyes closed, we saw that this was basically occurring every time that the, the during diastole the vessels are just collapsing upon themselves over and over again but as soon as we started doing this task activation it overcame this which was something we didn't expect it was a really cool kind of um, response that we saw so when we look at this um, these are the curves right so we have our physiological control in red and we have the various um, breathing changes so we can see at baseline when carbon dioxide is increased, well, we have an increased baseline and vice versa. When it's reduced, we have a reduced baseline. Again, um, when we look at the relative changes, well, the slopes are drastically different. Um, yeah. And again, if we look at the blood pressure influences, these are also changed as well relative to the physiological control. And so kind of the point and kind of what I was trying to hint at with this or kind of explain is if we look at this example, um, there are a lot of factors that go into what we measure. And to have the best internal validity, the best estimates, the best understanding of what's going on, for example, if we're quantifying a neurovascular coupling response through finger tapping, you know, an end back task, um, where's Waldo task in this case, um, ideally, if we're doing this, we would want to isolate this aspect while controlling for the others. Um, this nonetheless, obviously, is, is difficult. It requires a lot of uh, expertise equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But it allows us to obtain a very uh, comprehensive understanding, a valid assessment of what's going on in the brain. And now, obviously, the other consideration is, well, if we're just measuring you know, a resting task where someone's sitting quietly and not moving, um, for example, the examples I or showed were kind of some sort of extremes, right? So end titles were increased 10 millimeters of mercury or reduced 15 millimeters of mercury. You probably wouldn't see that within your testing session, 
But nonetheless, it kind of, I think it kind of gets the ball rolling in that, okay, physiology is important and we should find ways in which we can measure this and kind of control for this. And again, if we tie that back into the concussion example, we may have better ability to discern various clinical populations, right? So for example, if we saw no difference at return to play between uh, a healthy control versus acutely concussed, but there are difference in breathing patterns. Well, if we control for those breathing patterns, they could still have um, impaired cerebral blood flow regulation, um, that now we're returning them to play when they're not actually ready to go back to play, um, which could lead to subsequent injuries um, down the line. So how do we do, how do we do this? How do we control for this? Um, well, with our kind of my background, like I mentioned, I'm kinesiology, the physiology aspect is with our measures, we have this nice kind of lab chart here that has all our measures coming in. Um, and we're able to, on a beat to beat breath, this beat to beat um, basis, watch blood pressure come in, watch end titles come in. And so we can coach participants as needed. So if someone starts hyperventilating or breathing quicker, we can just calmly tell them, just keep breathing nice and slow, just, just take nice slow breaths. And we kind of coach them to ensure that this maintains at an adequate level. And something I really noticed that was cool while I was collecting this data um, and also watching the nearest the NEARS data come in was I looked at this relationship between kind of the movement in, in, our, in our NEARS kind of raw trace and the blood pressure trace that we recorded. Um, and I'm just going to overlay them and you can see how relatable these are and that a lot of the movement within the NEARS is explained by this blood pressure influence. Other important thing to notice too is, is you can see um, the heart rate aspect down here typically with the barrel reflex is the inverse relationship. So again, why would we want to control physiology? What's the importance of it? Well, if we can find ways that we can say, oh, hey, look, this response is influenced by this systemic blood pressure influence, not only can we monitor these physiological changes during the data collection, but can we find ways where we can use this in the post-processing? Um, can we find ways where we can help this clean the data and allow us to make better estimates? Um, and so that's why I think kind of the future is having these platforms that we can, or devices, hardware, software, that we can combine um, a lot of physiological parameters, such as lab chart or the NIRIS wings, where we can get these measures of, you know, temperature or respiration or heart rate or whatnot, just because it's going to allow us to make those better estimates. And again, that was 15 minutes on the physiology. You still might be thinking, okay, yes, I agree. What's the purpose of that? How is that going to influence our measures? And I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, next up, I'm going to talk about my multimodal imaging protocol and sort of why, why I'm hoping to employ what, what I'm doing. So as mentioned, I am part of a concussion background, part of a concussion lab. I've had numerous concussions myself. Um, and there's emerging literature in the field demonstrating that if we perform a simple task, well, that may not be sensitive enough to discern differences between a healthy population and a concussed population. And there's this notion within the field that, well, if we have participants perform a dual task where they engage in a multitude of tasks, then we can see the difference. So for example, it's common for participants to um, do a gait task. So they, they assess their walking, their sway, their balance, their gait. Um, and they look at how this changes following concussion compared to controls. And typically, if you do this independently, you may or may not see a difference. Typically, you don't. Um, however, some researchers are now starting to combine this with a cognitive task. So for example, it could be as simple as while you're walking, subtract seven from 600 sequentially. So you have to go 600, 593, 586. So now you throw this cognitive task into this motor-based task. Um, and it's increasing the ability to see the difference or discern the differences between these populations. Um, and in my mind, and I bring up this example because I see multimodal imaging as similar in this aspect, in that we can assess a multitude of changes, we can assess different functionality during a given task to see if the relationship has changed. Um, and so, for example, if we think about the neurovascular unit, well, this is a compli complicated relationship between a lot of things, right? We have our astrocytes, we have glial cells, we have our arteries, we have our capillaries, we have our neurons. Um, and a lot of various diseases will say, well, it's more neurological in, in nature. It's more um, supervascular in nature. 
But if we can find ways where we can categorize this together and look at the neuronal response to the diminished cerebrovascular response, we may increase our ability to understand these different pathological diseases, which could help with the prevention, um, help with the diagnosis, treatment, et cetera, et cetera. As well as there's been a lot of promise, especially, um, like I said, I'm kind of come from a transcranial Doppler ultrasound background. Doing this independently in the large conduit vessels in the brain has demonstrated a lot of differences between healthy controls and clinical populations. And so now I can only imagine when we start combining, when we start looking at the physiology, well, we have a better assessment. As well, the other important aspect is, and why I brought up the physiology and why I kind of stress that, is if we're trying to understand this neurovascular unit, you know, the signaling processes, it's important to control for the influences of carbon dioxide or blood pressure. Because if we're measuring and we're looking at the specific signaling, well, if a Meyer wave now goes through and it completely impacts the measure, we want to ensure that we're not concluding that the signaling is due to any influence from the Meyer wave or is due to um, carbon dioxide. And so it essentially allows us to isolate this response independently. And so now with that, I'm going to kind of jump into my multimodal project. Um, and essentially kind of it's a goofy example, but it's kind of I find a fun way to kind of explain what I'm doing. Um, basically, with MRI, we get this, we can, with full MRI, we get these cool pictures of the brain, right? We can assess, people look at it, and we're like, whoa, look at the colors on the brain, super cool. Um, however, it doesn't have its limit, or it has its limitations, right? With, we, with the big scanner, well, you can't have any movement. Um, it can be loud, so if you think about a concussed population, well, that's a limitation. Um, you can't have any, med or any metal or anything like that, because again, we have the magnet. So then for any other physiological controls we're doing, we have to ensure that there's no magnets within them if we're trying to control blood pressure and titles, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially the way I kind of look at my project um, is kind of doing something along these lines. So taking what we can get from an MRI um, in broad terms, like this big comprehensive pretty picture of the brain while we can do this during dynamic tests, right? And so this is kind of what I'm kind of hoping and, and seeking to do with my project. Um, so what specifically does this look like? This is currently our work in progress. Um, this was kind of our pilot testing. As you can see, there's a lot going on. Um, the first kind of setup, which I'll get into, took, took quite a bit of time. Um, other thing I would like to stress is this is, again, pilot testing, beta testing. I'm open to all feedback, open to suggestions, recommendations. Um, I'm, again, this is... Um, the moment you start combining all these different modalities, rely upon expertise from people from other fields. So um, I will have my email at the end. I'm always open to hear suggestions, uh, comments. So please, yeah, feel free to reach out. So essentially with my protocol, what I'm looking to do is combine this FNIRS with electroencephalography, with transcranial Doppler ultrasound, while controlling for these other factors, right? So controlling for end titles, controlling for heart rate, autonomic activity, controlling for blood pressure, um, and this is, again, allows us to isolate what's happening in the brain, use these other physiological measures as controls for either the cleaning processes or within the statistical models, um, something along those lines. So we talked about kind of these physiological aspects, and now I'm going to dive into the other aspects, so the, the neuroimaging modalities. So you might be thinking, well, these three are kind of un unorthodox together. There maybe have been one paper that has completed something along these lines, but nothing to this extent. Why are you doing that? What's the purpose? Well, the reason, the rationale for, again, why I'm doing what I'm doing is if we think about what these are measuring, well, we have our FNIRs, we're measuring that oxygenation within the microvasculature, right? The superficial regions of the brain. We combine that with electroencephalography. Um, yes, you can get deeper structures with the brain, but as soon as you start doing multimodal, typically you don't have the same space upon the head. So you don't have the same ability to, to capture deeper in the brain, right? So for mine, we're just looking at the superficial region, the yeah, regions, the neural activation during various tasks. And then we think about combining that with transcranial output ultrasound. Well, that's also going to give us an assessment of what's happening deep in the brain or the main conduit vessels that supply blood flow to the microvasculature, the capillaries, right? So it's the upstream impacts. And with this, we're typically going to quantify the either middle cerebral artery so the one that feeds a lot of the higher order thinking, the motor regions, 
um, or the and the posterior cerebral artery. As mentioned, that's the one that feeds a lot of the visual cortices. So if we think about this, the overlay, what we're going to get, well, it looks a lot like this. So we're going to have an understanding of the supravasculature aspects, we'll be able to relate that to the neuronal aspects, and look at that relationship to the deep vessels. Another way to think about it is if we relate this back to the neurovascular unit, where we'll be able to discern the differences between this uh, neuronal firing, look at that relationship with the microvasculature. Again, FNIRs were able to indirectly quantify the neuronal aspect, as well as link these to the upstream changes that are going to drive blood flow to these regions. Um, and so we're going to be hopefully be able to capture this really cool assessment of what's happening in the brain during various tasks. And where am I in the process? As mentioned, I'm currently pulling my hair out, collecting data. Um, we collected a bit of pilot data at the start, um, unfortunately, and this is kind of what this looks like. Um, life sort of happened, and so I don't have any data to show currently. Um, but hopefully within the next month or kind of couple months, we'll be able to stuff will settle down and I'll be able to, uh, to get to that and get some of this out there. Um, so for the, my specific project, what we were hoping to do, and I'll tie this in a bit later on, um, why I spe did these specific protocols and not maybe some of your, your more generic ones that you might be used to, um, and I'll tie that in. So again, what we did is we did a Where's Waldo task and we did a finger tapping task. Uh, we did both of these with all the kind of physiology, all the neuroimaging assessments at three different conditions. So we did this uh, at rest. So basically participants are just seated, engaging in these tasks. Then we also completed these while performing squat stand maneuvers at two different frequencies. Um, so it basically looked like this, where we got these six measures. Um, and the reason why we did these is because we wanted to see what we could and couldn't do. Um, again, we really wanted to challenge the systems, both the physiology, but also the neuroimaging aspect to see, okay, well, to what extent can we get clean data to allow us to kind of inform the next steps of my PhD. And so again, we engaged in these kind of more complex tasks to understand, okay, well, if you think about just the rested, eyes closed, seated task, more than not likely you'd be able to complete that because it doesn't require any movement or anything along these lines. And so from there, I'm going to just kind of dive into the considerations I've experienced, as well as the kind of my recommendations. Uh, if anyone's interested in, do, in doing this, if you had never thought about it, but now you're interested, um, you know, it may not be the exact protocol that I'm doing, but it could be something else. Uh, I'm just going to give a few recommendations about things that I've experienced um, to hopefully help not waste, you know, time, resources, energy, money. Um, if you can learn, I would from others' mistakes, I think that's awesome. Um, so I'm just gonna go through and kind of talk about some of the issues I faced or the pitfalls. Uh, and so one of the first things I would always recommend is to understand what you can and can't do. So when you're combining the different imaging modalities, understand what is possible te technologically um, and what you can and can't do. And so for example, I just went through the literature, looked at my main neuroimaging devices and kind of just quickly assessed um, or, or how to scrutinize, okay, what's feasible, what's not. Uh, and I'll bring in an example for this, right? So for TCD, it is very robust during numerous different tests, right? So for example, here, we have a participant running at an incline of 15 degrees. Um, their heart rate's, I think, around 180, 190. So they're near the end of their max test, and we're still getting pretty good signals, um, right? We can also do this during various other tests, right? So here's a upright cycling as well as during lower body negative pressure um, with this psychometer inside, as you can see there. Um, and again, this is in the supine position, right? Um, so again, if we think about this, well, how does movement impact our measures? For example, when we know TCD is super robust, um, FNIRS, again, probably depends upon the modality. If we're doing a maximal treadmill test, maybe not. If we're doing an upright cycling and we can kind of isolate the upper body movement so it's not happening as much, we may be able to get a measure with the supine cycling. I'll get you, you can watch um, You can watch my head move. Again, there are some movements, but not anything too, too crazy. So again, if we kind of design some way to strap the participants in so that we could isolate again the head so there's no movement, would that be possible? Um, so again, this kind of gets back to uh, my next recommendation, which is have an equipment hierarchy. 
Um, and the reason, again, why I say this is this is going to help dictate what tasks you're going to do um, and, and kind of the, what, what you're going to implement. And so, for example, for mine, well, I had these three. So I had FNIRS, EEG, um, and TCD. And basically, the consensus was we're going to look at these two primarily. And so we're going to develop our protocol or task based upon what we can and can't do with these. Um, and so, for example, Typically, what you may engage in is some sort of finger tapping task. And if we think about this task, this is going to you know, undoubtedly stimulate the uh, excitatory response within the neurons over the motor cortices, which would be quantifiable with the EEG. Um, we could look at the microvascular changes with FNIRS. But again, based upon the equipment hierarchy, can we get a upstream? Is this task sufficient enough to cause a large enough response upstream to be able to quantify it, right? So for example, um, we engage in the Where's Waldo task because it produces such a robust response. Um, and the counteract to that side is, well, typically with EEG, you don't want any sort of eye movements. You want them staring at the center of a screen, typically on a fixation cross, so you don't move it. Um, and so with that task, well, we may be able to get something with e, uh, FNIRS or TCD, to what extent can we do this with EEG? Um, and again, that's kind of why we chose those finger tapping and where's welcome task is we want to understand, okay, what can and can't we do with regards to this neurovascular coupling assessment? And this also brings in another key thing that I didn't even think about, um, but consider the tasks based upon also not only the equipment hierarchy, but also the other physiological measures you're collecting. Um, and so as mentioned, we did the finger tapping task but a common thing that we measure is these other physiological confounders. And one thing we look at is this blood pressure aspect. Um, and this is typically on the middle of the finger. Um, and this was just one of the first assessments we did. We kind of threw everything together and kind of put it on. We're like, let's record, let's see what's happened. Let's see what's feasible. And so essentially what we found is you can see on this graph here, this green trace here is the mean arterial pressure or the, the blood pressure trace. So we have systolic at the top, diastolic at the bottom. And again, when we had the cuff on the middle finger and we start engaging in these finger tapping protocols, you can see how the trace was impacted, right? Now we have more deviation, we have more error. Um, systole, systole is not what it is. Diastole is not what it should be. Um, and if we relate this and compare this to just the 15 seconds we're not finger tapping, well, the trace then goes back to very robust. And if we talk about what we mentioned previously with how, well, potentially in the future, having this B2B blood pressure trace, this mirror arterial pressure trace may help with the, you know, post-processing, cleaning the data. If we compare the data we got from when we were engaging in this finger tapping task, when we weren't, you can see the amount of standard deviation um, or the uh, error variance that was put into the data during this, again, simply because we were impacting our measure. And, Again, it's one of those things that I never thought of would happen, but you kind of kind of just jump full force in and then you adapt as, as kind of you need. Um, and the other aspect of this is, so what we tried, and this is kind of what worked a bit better, is we simply just moved the Finipress or the finger photoplasmography device to the index finger um, and then just tap the back three fingers together. Um, the other aspect you could do is just do a one-sided task, again, which would be another consideration. Um, but, but as you can kind of see, there's a lot of thought and big thing, just failure that goes into this to kind of help get to the final uh, kind of final promise line. Uh, fourth one is develop a montage based upon uh, the task and equipment possibilities. So, you know, with FNIRS in this case, um, part of what I've been exposed to is a lot of prefrontal regions, kind of the frontal cortices, um, moving down some of the side of the front. Um, but I'm sure you may have noticed this throughout the rest of the talk. With TCD, we have this clunky head frame. And if you compare where this head frame is relative to where the optodes are on the right side or the, in the right picture, it minimizes our ability to put optodes there. As well as you can see, we have this big clunky aspect that goes over the top of the head, um, which we ended up having to remove. And we, again, we played a, a, with a lot of different designs. We used different uh, strings, shoelaces as a way to kind of keep it, keep it secure. And so it didn't move. And it, we eventually found a way, but again, a lot of failure and everything that went into it. 
So essentially what our protocol ended up looking like was, and again, this is pilot, we want to see what's feasible and what's not. Um, we were limited in where we could and couldn't put different optodes. Um, so essentially we just ran two strips from the front to the back from where we were able. Again, you can kind of see where this was placed and on the side of the head, how close it was getting uh, to this head frame. Um, some important aspects too is, again, when we started employing that multimodal imaging protocol that hasn't been done like this before, um, like I mentioned, we wanted to see what was possible and what wasn't. Uh, and so we did try to do or put some on within, within the occipital region, the parietal region. Uh, I know it's not as common in the field, um, but it was either we just reduce the amount and get a better sampling frequency, or we, you know, just try and see what happens. And I think that's, that's kind of the purpose of just the, the pilot aspect was what can and can't we do? And I don't know if it was the participants we had, or if it was something to do with the head frame kind of squeezing the hair, um, but we got pretty, or the raw data coming in looked, looked pretty adequate and looked, it looked really good. So I'm excited to kind of dive into it and see, see what we get. And so that kind of brings me to my fifth and final recommendation that's kind of overarching. Um, and this is just pilot. Sometimes you don't know until you try and that's okay. Um, fail, expect failure. There's a lot for, for what happened with mine um, that, you know, you just kind of roll with the punches and you just look at it as a learning opportunity and be like, okay, this doesn't work. How can we counteract this? Um, and then just adapt from there. The other cool thing that we did for my study was we had participants come in at two time points. So this was separated by about a week. Um, and I think for the pilot data, we had about 15 people come in. Um, and essentially what we, or the rationale for this was, well, if someone comes in, say in week one, we can make modif modifications, adjust things. So when they, they come back on the second time point, we can see, we can assess, be like, hey, does this better? Does this work? Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, as you will see coming up, uh, the importance of trying to make it as comfortable as possible with uh, clinical populations. Uh, but before I get into that, I have to talk about one aspect that uh, I'm not going to take any credit for. Um, and this was just kind of the time sinking aspect. Um, and for this, I got to give a big shout out to both Ibu um, and Andrew. Um, I couldn't, this project wouldn't be possible without them. Um, if anyone, they are both on the job market. So if anyone's looking for a doctor, soon to be doctor, highly recommend. Um, but again, if we think about the different platforms that we're using, right, we have all this different imaging modality coming in and we needed three separate platforms to collect all the data because as of right now, there wasn't one comprehensive one, right? Um, so we had to find ways to send a common trigger to all of these devices so that we can capture things down to the millisecond. Um, one thing for mine is we did, or for the pilot aspect, we didn't really look at any event related potentials or anything upon those lines. But again, if that is kind of the future and what someone would be interested in, um, again, this aspect would become even more important um, rather than if you're just kind of looking for the broad based task and you just need kind of a start end or when someone opens or closes their eyes. So it's the difference between a thousand triggers and 10 triggers. Uh, the other aspect was just the comfortability. So as mentioned, participants came in at multiple time points and we adjusted this as needed. Uh, a lot of participants complained during the first aspect of the head frame being too tight. And so, um, for example, here, we adjusted the foam. This was actually, a hard, we started with like kind of a medium foam. We tried a hard foam, we tried soft foam. Um, again, we typically where that bar came across, we tried different shoelaces, um, other pieces of string, fabric, just any sort of way possible to see how can we make this more possible, yeah, more feasible, um, especially the moment we start to implement it into clinical populations. Um, especially within kinesiology is, um, I'm, I always love, you know, doing exercise tests um, for the exercise physiologists in, in, in the various labs, um, and that's no issue to me. However, that's not the case for everyone, and that kind of applies with our neuroimaging approach is that yes, this is possible, this is feasible for, and you know, someone who's a graduate student will wear this happily and not complain. But the moment we start to implement this into clinical populations, right? You think about a concussion. Um, someone with a concussion, very acutely, who's dealing with symptoms, has headache, pressure in the head. Well, if we then say, okay, we're gonna attach all this equipment, that's even further gonna increase the pressure. Uh, that might not be the best. So again, we, we big aspect is just trying to figure out what's comfortable and what's possible. 
Um, other th big thing was just the amount of wires, as I'm sure you could imagine, and trying to figure out how to deal with this. Um, again, this is part of the reason why we did those squat stand maneuvers, because we want to see, okay, to what extent can we control or to what extent can we have participants perform movement-based or, or dynamic-based tasks? Um, and this kind of just allowed us, again, to determine what, what can and can't we do moving forward. So again, as as you can see, it was just, we don't know, we have an idea, let's just roll with it, let's, let's attempt it and see what happens. Um, and then the other big thing is just reaching out to people with the specific expertise and the setup considerations. Um, just because when we first went to implement all this, I think it took us around the undergrad I was working with, I think it took us around 90 minutes from start to, to, uh, to we first started collecting data which is too long for you know, any other population, but it was a lab mate who I had helped a lot. So um, they weren't too concerned and they said, yeah, take your time. Again, I understand I'm the first one, feel free, just, just pilot and whatnot. So again, having a participant who, you know, for a lab mate or whatnot and setting it up on each other um, is super important and helpful. All right, so that kind of gives you a application of um, my protocol, the pilot aspect, now I'm gonna kind of go into two directions. So one, I'm gonna talk about my immediate directions with my PhD and where I'm hoping to apply this um, and the specific aspects, as well as kind of the future directions um, specifically for, for kind of our lab and what we're hoping to do. And so one big aspect that I'm really uh, excited to answer with my PhD is um, this is a study that I'm a part of and is currently under revisions in the Journal of Applied Physiology. And essentially we looked at um, the time course or the impact of exercise on various supervascular parameters. Um, and one thing we want to explore was the impact or the amount of females that were in these studies because there's largely been, uh, especially within physiology-based studies, it's largely male biased. Um, so unfortunately, if we are making clinical decisions based upon studies that have a male bias in them, that may not be clinically appropriate um, for anyone aside from males. And so it could lead to negative outcomes. Um, and so kind of the second aspect of my PhD is kind of hoping to apply this multimodal imaging protocol to understand and implement ways that we can kind of counteract this current bias. Um, and I'm gonna pick upon a certain researcher uh, in this graph, um, but don't feel too bad because it is myself. So. Um, for example, here you can see we had a study where we had 22% uh, of the participants were female. And I know what you're thinking, Joel, how could you? How dare you? Well, the reason why this was the case is because of the menstrual cycle. And in this study, we actually controlled for it in that we had participants come in from days three to seven of the menstrual cycle. And so as you can imagine, if we have two months to run a study, right? Um, we have limited time, we have limited resources, and we only have five out of 28 days. Well, that gives us around that 20%, right? And so the inherent nature is if we're trying to control for this factor, how can we do that? Um, or can we find ways to increase the ability to test, right? And a lot of this thought is, well, we know changing hormones are going to change the compliance of the vasculature. Therefore, to what extent is this going to impact our measure, right? So for example, just because estrogen changes, does that impact the regulatory mechanisms of the brain? And if it doesn't, um, well, then that's going to be able to increase our ability to test female subjects, um, as well as a big aspect is if you think clinically, especially in concussion populations, concussions don't just happen to females on days three to seven of the menstrual cycle. They happen at all the time points or across, across any different time point, right? So um, again, just finding ways to kind of guide, help guide future directions to make research uh, more generalizable. Um, and so to do this, we've teamed up with a company out of uh, Oregon, west coast of the states. Um, and they're, they're basically we're able to find ways to measure hormone concentrations through dried urine uh, sampling. So essentially, we're going to be able to quantify these various aspects um, and then use it as control and regression and see the extent that these impacts are measured. Um, the other really cool thing is, so essentially we're going to look at all these regulatory mechanisms of brain blood flow, how they're impacted by the menstrual cycle, um, as well as there's a lot of evidence demonstrating that um, if you engage in regular exercise, um, you're going to have a healthier vasculature. 
And again, this is a kinesiology bias I have, um, yay exercise. Um, so again, we're, we're controlling for, okay, well, how do these hormones also impact the compliancy differences between fit, sedentary, um, moderate fitness, um, fitness levels. And so that's kind of the second aim of my PhD and kind of where I'm hoping to apply this. So you can see first aspect, it's kind of the, the grunt work, the basic physiology, kind of assessing these different relationships. And then the second aspect is applying it to these various um, kind of healthy populations. But nonetheless, as we talked about, I think multimodal imaging is going to be super helpful when it comes to the future of um, pathological uh, diseases, disorders, clinical populations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, if we think about that neurovascular unit and we think about trying to quantify that neurovascular coupling response. If we have one measure, will we sense a difference potentially? Um, and there's a lot of literature showing that yes, we can, but the more and more we add, the better comprehensive understanding we have when we can control for physiology, it's gonna increase our ability to do this. Um, and as mentioned, so I'm part of a concussion lab, the two main aspects that again, once we develop this, once we understand these confounding controls, is we're, especially with my lab, we're hoping to implement this into two specific populations. Um, and one, no doubtably, is sport-related concussion. Um, University of Calgary is probably within the top five universities in the world uh, for assessing sport-related concussion and the amount of research coming out in this topic, especially within pediatrics. Um, so it's an absolutely incredible place to be for anyone who wants to do this sort of research. Um, and previous research has demonstrated that um, and this is with uh, some John, my supervisor's work, is we see these changes immediately following this neurovascular coupling response within 72 hours. Um, and again, this is just the main conduit vessel in the brain changing. Um, so it'd be super cool to see the microvasculature relationship to that, um, as well as that neuronal activation. And so again, common thought is, well, if there's a greater increase in total activation, likely more nutrients are required to accomplish the same task. And so therefore, again, we can look at, well, is hyperconnectivity uh, occurring? How does that relate to the changes in blood or blood flow, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the other important aspect that, and again, I, I like to bring light to this because I think it's very underrepresented. And when you talk about concussions, um, it's a topic that I feel is, it, it doesn't come to mind, right? When you think about concussions, you kind of in Canada, you think, oh, Sidney Crosby. Um, you think about hockey, you think about football with CTE. Um, while that research is important, um, in my opinion, there's a silent epidemic happening, which is intimate partner violence. Um, and this is something that John, my one supervisor, has done a bit of work on previously. And within the next couple of years, we're kind of hoping to kind of keep going here within Calgary. Um, and we're kind of in the process of trying to find ways to um, fund some of this research uh, moving forward. And why I bring this up is... I can't remember the exact stat, but it was something along the lines of for every one NHL player who gets a concussion throughout through in a given season, there's going to be around 5,000 women who experience some sort of intimate partner violence, um, which again, not minimizing the one NHL player, but that is, again, when you think about it, they have access to care, treatment, all these other things. Meanwhile, there's 5,000 other individuals who you know, they, they may have to stay in the same situation, unfortunately. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the money is funded more towards the sport related aspect. Um, and so some of the research is we're hoping to apply this because we do notice and we have seen that there are substantial changes that we didn't expect within the brain, um, just using uh, transcranial Doppler ultrasound. So I think employing also looking at the neuronal aspect and the microvasculature is going to be incredibly promising. Um, and one other aspect I, I found every time I see this, it's, it's shocking to me. Um, this was just looking at symptom reporting between healthy populations, concussed populations, and those who are survivors of intimate partner violence. Um, and basically, I'll draw your attention to the differences. And so in this case, we have the bar, the red bar, the smaller one, is those who've had three previous concussions at baseline. So history of concussions at baseline. They have a few symptoms, no doubtably, but you can see within the intimate partner violence who are basically two and a half years since their last concussion, two and a half years with a range of two months to 10 years following their injury. So 
average of two and a half years, people are still walking around with this amount of symptoms. Um, and then if we look at the severity, again, substantially higher. And again, if we think about this, well, relative to acute concussion, so again, someone who's been cussed within 72 hours, so if anyone's had a concussion, you understand this completely, it's still smaller than what these individuals are experiencing on a daily basis. Um, and so I'm hoping, you know, this, this increases, especially with the concussion research, this kind of notion. Um, there has been quite a few more researchers kind of noting this and trying to do this. And so this is one big aspect that I'm hoping um, to be a part of moving forward, um, as well as uh, numerous other pathophysiological changes that can occur. Um, so with that, I'd like to give a big shout out to um, all my supervisors, uh, postdocs, graduate students, undergrads who have helped with this process. Um, can't say thank you enough, and I'm sure I'll be reaching out to you more, so expect that. Um, and again, there, I, so there's my email. If you have any comments, questions, um, as mentioned, I know this neuroimaging modality approach may not be entirely what you're expecting. Hopefully you took something away from it that maybe you can implement. Um, and yeah, I'm, again, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to accept all of critiques, recommendations, um, kind, of, kind of suggestions on how I can improve what I'm doing. Um, with that, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to speak and kind of present what I'm doing. Thank you so much, Joel. This is really just um, many examples of extremely courageous work. Um, some of the topics you brought up, just this exploratory um, aspect of, of looking into multiple modalities and a lot of different applications. Um, I think it's, I'm just personally gonna say that I, I really applaud it because I think it's something that um, we don't see as much as we probably should in science to be able to just go after some things Put a bunch of stuff on people, see what the data shows us. Um, too much, we just have to go along the lines of really regimented um, experimentation. But anyway, so I think what we'll do is jump into a couple of questions. Joel, I think you have a few from um, webinar registrants whenever they signed up to see if we have um, a couple of topics we can discuss. Do you have those there in front of you, or should I? Pull those up. Um, I can pull them up quickly. This should be. Um, I have them. I have them here as well. So um, the the first one was about adequate physiology sensors to inform about Meyer waves, um, invasive motion with FNIRs. So a little bit about um, maybe what you think are these additional measures that are really gonna help inform on sort of the Meyer wave influence on FNIR signal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, I think as I demonstrated, having the finger photoplasmography um, is super beneficial. Um, I think that's one of the best ways that you can see it. Um, it's pretty remarkable in some of the participants we've tested, in, in, including the very high fitness, or the individuals with this incredibly high fitness, um, they have, a natural Meyer wave going through that's cycling between 20 to 30 millimeters of a uh, swing in blood pressure every 10 seconds. Um, and it's absolutely, it, it's super cool to see, but annoying to get any measure on because trying to time it specifically and uh, adjust for that um, is kind of annoying, but nonetheless, uh, it, it gives us that ability to, to quantify it. Um, so right away, that would probably be one of the, the best ways. Um, in my mind, I think it would be really cool to, again, look at the ability of uh, short channel sensors to also discriminate some of that and see if they're, that's related to um, the finipress aspect. Um, so again, that could be another, another avenue. Um, so I'm sure there are kind of numerous ways we could, um, as well as those are just the non-invasive. Um, if you want to go invasive and try and find some um, poke into the blood and actually get a true measure of um, arterial blood pressure, that would be another way. Um, so there are probably quite a few different ways, but just again, depending upon what you're wanting to do. Uh, I also understand the other limitation is that equipment is expensive. And so that's the other trade-off of, um, you know, not being able to do this. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, we have a uh, Finipress Nova and it's what's commonly used in our field. Uh, and that, that's what we use to control for that. 
Great, thanks for elaborating there. So I think the second, the uh, next question, I guess, um, posed before the webinar itself, could you discuss research on hyperscanning studies uh, in combination of FNIRs with measures of systemic parameters like heart rate, et cetera? Um, so from what I understand, hyperscanning is kind of the multi or assessing two people at the same time and kind of looking at the related physio or similar physiology. Um, I'm not too well versed in that field. Um, but nonetheless, I could 100% see how, um, you know, for example, you know, common example, you see a friend that you haven't seen in a long time, how excited you get and kind of how your sympathetic drive is going to change, right? Um, so I could 100% see that physiology would change because the moment you start interacting with others, um, you know, you may get butterflies or you kind of have that different feeling or you could change your end titles. Um, so I'm sure there is, I don't know off the top of my head, but this specific research about that. Um, the other aspect that I could see being difficult is if you're trying to do some communication, but you have mouthpieces in, um, <laughs> which would make it kind of hard to talk, right? So from there, you may have to do some arterial sampling um, where you look at the uh, partial pressure of arterial oxygen or carbon dioxide. So you actually go into the vasculature. Um, that could potentially be a way. Very good. So there was um, a question about EEG and FNIRS combined modality case. I think um, there wasn't a lot elaborated there. Um, you kind of touched on it quite a bit um, in being able to place a lot of things on the head at once, uh, doing all three modalities at the same time. Um, any other any other things that you didn't touch upon already that might be that came to mind? Um, so as of right now, um, again, a lot of what I've kind of been doing is more of the implementation of it um, and not necessarily the post aspect, right? So I'm sure the moment I start kind of figure out the post application or the, po the, the, the processing, um, looking at the relationships, there's going to be a lot more that comes out um, and I'll probably learn tons more. There, I feel like there were other considerations. Um, I'm trying to think. I know, again, a lot of what I am doing was built upon the work that uh, both Andrew Lapointe and Ibukant have been working on. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of, I don't want to say I've ridden their coattails, but um, they, they, they spent a lot of time implementing the FNIRs and the EEG aspect. Um, and then I kind of, you know, learned from what they were doing and then added in these other measures. So um, a lot of that basis and groundwork was, was done by those two individuals. Yeah. Yeah, I know you gave a shout out um, to Andrew and Ibu already. There, there's a related question and that's in the chat there. You can read it as well, but it just says, how do you synchronize various amplifiers used for recording these different parameters? You know, you mentioned triggering, getting some triggering help from them. Yes. Um, so for what we did is we basically created, oh, this actually ties into other recommendations. Um, it, that, that triggered something, pun. Um, so there was a, <laughs> um, yeah, so what we did is we created our protocol in CyclePy. Um, and from that, we sent it out through using a C-pod, and then we had a parallel port replicator, and then that was sent to our three devices. So we sent it to our three different laptops that we were co collecting data from. Um, one aspect about that and kind of thinking about how, if I could go back and redesign the protocol, um, a lot of what we've done in the past for physiological studies is, again, have flexibility in when we're measuring it. So for example, if we're doing... 30 second on 30 second off task we will adjust as needed so we'll have a 30 second on but we may watch end titles because if someone starts hyperventilating well rather than just completely getting rid of a trout we could delay the start of the next one by 15 seconds until breathing has gone back to normal um, and so in have having more kind of flexibility in the kind of data collection aspect where you can control when tasks start when tasks stop the different aspects within it um, I think that's something I'll probably be doing moving forward. Very good. 
so yeah, I'll, I'll solicit again if you have any other questions or, or have follow-ups um, on any of the points we just made, please feel free to, to throw something into the chat. Um, let's see, Andrew just maybe um, elaborated a little bit more. But um, I, I guess I have one for you, for you, Joel. So I think you touched on a lot of different areas, but um, I kind of was curious a little bit about where you sort of see like the clinical application going from your first kind of pilot data. Uh, I see you've got like a lot of information about how some different tasks are influencing a lot of these different measures. I'm kind of curious and, I, and it kind of brings to mind this difficulty in sort of setting up sort of a clinical um, application. And I think the biggest thing there is just interpersonal differences you brought up you know, certain, certain factors like menstrual cycle, the exercise level, a lot of different things that can influence all these measures. I wonder if you have a general thought about what of all these measures might be um, possible to characterize, or maybe you have to personalize them somewhat, but would they, do you get any sense for what if any of these or a combination of these would be useful in a clinical setting to sort of work with the concussion situation or maybe other things that are cerebrovascular and so, so on? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think it's always a aspect that as a neuroimager, you kind of go back and forth with because, you know, for example, with the MR scanner, you're never going to have one on the sideline of a football field where you can just have people come in and have a scan and go back to the game, right? Um, so it's kind of this trade-off to, well, with all the multimodal protocols that require specific expertise and all this other stuff that, you know, your general clinical population, if it's a nurse or athletic therapist or whatever, they may not have, um, as well as there's a lot of money that goes into some of these pieces of equipment. So not all hospitals, not all healthcare facilities are going to have these. Um, and so in my mind, the biggest impact this can have is kind of understanding those physiological changes in the lab-based setting um, and seeing how various treatments impact those. Um, so as I mentioned, we're talking about with exercise as a uh, rehabilitation strategy from concussion, um, what are the physiological changes that occur um, in a group of two groups of individuals who have a concussion, one with um, one who engages in the exercise protocol and one who doesn't. Um, and so in my mind, I think that's where we're going to have the biggest benefit, just because, again, I understand the clinical limitations of trying to have various people kind of collecting this data. Um, the one aspect I will say about that is that's current. Um, you know, it's amazing to see all the different imaging that's that's developing on our, on rapidly. Um, and you know, for example, we have what we call a shred mobile here at the University of Calgary that contains a lot of equipment that's basically hooked up in the back of a um, kind of RV where we can drive it to various sporting events. And so we can have one participant or one main person who oversees all the data collection go to these various assessments um, rather than having participants come in, right? Um, and so that could be a future as well. So I think it is a very interesting question and kind of something you have to go back and forth on is, okay, what's possible? But again, like next to me, I have a $50,000 um, lower body negative pressure chamber that has a cyclorgometer inside. Uh, there's probably five to 10 of those in the world like this. So to, to have to be like, oh, we're going to do this worldwide, it's probably not the most feasible. So I think, yeah, that, that's the balance we got to find. Right. But you're learning and characterizing um, a lot about these different factors and how they may, might influence some of these measures in, in different people. But that's great that you guys um, have utilized so many great tools this way. Um, yeah, so Andrew and, and Jeff have included a couple bits of information to follow on from some of these comments. Um, but yeah, looking for other questions. Elena, did we have another one that I missed? All right. Well, I think that might be all the questions we have for today. Um, I think Joel has, has solicited, feel free to reach out to him about questions. Uh, you can reach out to us at NARIX at consulting um, email address as well. 
but thank you all very much for a great um, webinar. Joel, do you have any other thoughts? Um, there was one question that was just put in I can speak to. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, could you comment on collecting data in young children? Um, I think that's a great comment, a great, a great kind of suggestion. Um, again, for my project, that's why we chose that 18 to 40. I guess I didn't go into this, but we chose it 18 to 40, um, just because again, then we minimize any developmental puberty issues, um, as well as then we kind of don't have the um, don't have the aging process as much within our measures. Um, and so, as of right now, again, we're just kind of trying to figure out is this possible, is this feasible within the easiest population to collect the data in before implementing it into others. Um, right away, some considerations I would kind of just note from the top of my head is that if you have a younger population, um, one, especially just seeing all the kind of high school students who come in and out and you see like, oh, you're taking my blood or something along those lines, whereas graduate students are like, ah, do, do whatever you need. Um, so there is some aspect of, well, you may need more um, familiarization with them. You need to talk them through it. Again, um, a university, especially just coming as first year, is a very intimidating setting. Um, so you can imagine a high school student now or a, even younger, um, that could impact the measures. The other thing too is if you think about the difference in head sizes. Typically, this might not impact it for you know a high school student, but if you're doing young children, um, and they, right, if we think about the head frame you may have less room up top now. So that's going to affect the optode layout that we choose to do. And therefore that would impact the tasks that we might do. Um, so again, as you can see, there's a lot of kind of, you change one thing, you have to change everything else. Um, so again, probably best thing to do was um, like, again, try it, find someone who would be interested in that um, and then just kind of adjust it as necessary. But likely there would probably be some changes that we would need to make. But aside from that, yeah, no, nothing, nothing else on my, my end. As mentioned, I um, opened all suggestions. You won't hurt my feelings, I promise. So sounds good. So yeah, unless we see any other questions, I think maybe we'll wrap up for today. Thanks again, Joel. It was very great to hear all about all of this. Appreciate it very much, and we'll look forward to seeing everyone again at the next webinar. Thank <laughs> you.